tonight on Revolutionaries. These boats are incredibly fast and incredibly powerful, and, and the guys that sail upon them are really a new generation of, of sailors. America's Cup in 2013 shocked the world with a new boat design, new strategies, and a revolution in video coverage. We go behind the scenes of the America's Cup in San Francisco with Team USA's Ian Burns, crew member Matt Mason, and television pioneer Stan Honey. Major funding for Revolutionaries is provided by the Intel Corporation. Since we're talking about technology under sail tonight, Talk a little bit about these boats, the technology behind them, and what makes them different from any boats that have ever been raced like this. Yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting. Matt, Matt always uh, underplays a little bit the uh, requirements on these boats, but um, these boats are incredibly fast and incredibly powerful, and, and the guys that sail upon them are really a new generation of, of sailors. Previous cups, you know, they're guys who are uh, 50 years old would sail on the boat, and they'd be um, quite often big, strong guys, and sometimes not, but they'd have long careers and they sail and they do relatively sedentary jobs on the old monohulls. On, on these boats, a new generation of sailors are really fit, agile guys who've got great aerobic capacity that can work hard for 30 minutes straight. But not only are they uh, putting in the horsepower like Matty does on the winch handles to power all of the hydraulics and sails, but they also are driving all of the electronic controls that connect the winches in a certain pattern to drive one of the winches, change the hydraulics, move the dagger boards, change the number of the hydraulic rams on. They're doing all of this while they're sailing, while they're grinding the winch handles, also being sprayed by basically a fire hose continuously over the top of what they're doing. <laughs> and um, this is all on San Francisco Bay on a short course where things change every few seconds. And so it's sort of a, a little understatement of Matt, Matt's, I guess, just to say that we had a pretty good day. I mean, it was um, a big challenge, as they always are out there. And, uh, you know, the guys really did a great job as usual. It's good. What is it? about the development of these boats that has sort of changed the course of racing history. Can you talk a little bit about what's happened in the last two or three years? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, one of the, a lot of you guys who are sailors will know all of this, but um, on all the monohulls, generally they're ballasted with lead, which means you're really carrying around a huge amount of uh, weight in the boats just to keep the boat stable and upright so it doesn't roll over against the forces of the wind. And, um, the mono, mono, monohulls are all pretty much like that. In general, the large monohulls we've always raced in the cup. These boats have no ballast. They're uh, purely uh, generating stability because they're very wide, but the hulls are very slender, which means they're incredibly efficient. And it's all about the efficiency of these boats because they're so powerful, so lightweight. The boats only weigh six tons for a 72-foot yacht, but they have the stability of probably equivalent uh, yacht that weighs 20 or 30 tons. So they are very powerful very, very low drag, and to uh, couple all of that efficiency and power, you need to have a wing sail, which is a whole new level of technology for this America's Cup for fleet racing or for a whole fleet of boats to have a wing sail. Once again, much more efficient than an old soft sail, a, a fabric sail that we've used in all the cups up until now. So Matt, the grinder, as Ian was talking about, you guys are the ones with the handles in your hands and you're just working constantly during a sail. Now, on a conventional boat, you'd be doing something entirely different from what you're doing on this boat. Can you talk about the role of a grinder before and a grinder now? Yeah, on the, on the bigger boats, uh, they, may, they have grinders as well, pedestals we call them, but they, they're, um, they would normally, well they would just be running the winches to, to sheet the sails. Um, we still have to do that, the wing has a sheet on it and the little front sail has a sheet, jib sheets on it as well. So we're still sheeting the sails, but we're also, the grinders are also, um, a lot of the systems or, you know, the majority of the systems on the boat are run by hydraulics. So it's, the rule doesn't allow any power, so you've got to, it's all manually created by the pedestal um, being turned. So you're either um, creating power for a winch or you're creating, or you're moving oil to run the hydraulic system. Um, so if you look, yeah, yeah it would, probably would have been hard to have pick up, picked up on this on the um, video there, but the boat on each hull has four cockpits, um, individual cockpits, and each one of those cockpits there's a pedestal, and two two guys get is on uh, either side of that pedestal, and they they 
they run, they um, you know they grind two guys on a pedestal. They grind together, and they can go in and out of hydraulics or sheets or um, do a combination of different things. And how do you know on the boat when it's time to do what you do and when it's time to let up? Well, that's just part of learning how to sail these boats, and every manoeuvre is different. Um, and you know that's been a big learning curve for us. Um, and we're just getting into our race side. We've been sort of uh, pushing the boats around the race course for the last, um, uh, you know, six weeks now. And it's, it's really no different to figuring out how you do a play on the football field and getting it right and nailing it. It's, it's all similar. You just have to uh, video and analyse all your manoeuvres and, um, you know, practice makes perfect. Yeah. We also have an uh, intercom system on the boat where the... Um Everybody can hear the helmsman and a few other guys as well, so that um, it's somewhat coordinated by, by our helmsman, Jimmy Spithill, making the commands, counting down until a manoeuvre occurs so that all the moves get uh, done. But it's repeated and repeated over and over so the guys can do it no matter what the situation and the, the pressure of the racing moment. Mm. So for the crew work side of it, we have, um, there's go we, we have four GoPros over the boat and then our coach... Um, he synchronises that at the end of each day. And in our sailing room, we have four big screens and they're all synchronised. And we debrief and, and hash it out and, you know, go out the next day and making steps every day. But let me get you in here, Stan, because you've got <clears throat> a pretty exceptional challenge, right? And you're, you're uh, a world-class sailor in your own right. What is it to try to keep up with the way these races unfold from the coverage that you have to do? Well, it's the key thing with the TV is to tell the story of the race so that the um, sports fans who aren't yet sailing fans can understand, you know, the nature of the competition, the ways the different teams are, you know, have different strengths than one another. Um, and then the approach that we've taken, you know, to this sport is to just make a ton of measurements. You know, we know where every boat is, every mark is within a couple of centimeters. And then to, you know, illustrate by inserting graphics into the live video, illustrate the important things about the event that are otherwise hard to see. I want to show everyone here a little bit of the technology that you've been responsible for before and what you're doing now with the America's Cup. So we have some slides. Talk about this one first. Um, this one was not well received. <laughs> um, this is the hockey puck. The hockey, the, the hockey puck. The, the Fox Tracks hockey puck. I had um, co-founded with a colleague, Ken Melns, a company called ETAC, which is a pioneered vehicle navigation and rotating maps, and ended up selling that to Rupert Murdoch. So um, I ended up as a head of technology for a media company, which I'd never expected. I got to know David Hill, who was then starting Fox Sports, and would have periodic conversations with David Hill every week or so. And he asked me to always talk about ways in which technology could affect the televising of sports. So on one of these lunches, I told him that it was just becoming computationally feasible to do graphic insertions in live video that were properly registered into the real world. So you could, for example, put in a fake billboard um, David told me something I was to hear many times over the years from David, that it was the stupidest thing he'd ever heard. <laughs> but he said, if you could put stuff into live video of the real world that was accurately positioned in the real world, could you do something useful, like show something that's hard to see and important? And his example was, you know, could you track and highlight the hockey puck? Um, and in those days, it was hard to see the puck because it was standard definition. Um, I told David that, uh, yeah, it was possible, and the group of guys I'd worked with at SRI International nearby, right. here in Menlo Park, we'd tracked things that were much tougher, but that he couldn't afford it. <laughs> um, <laughs> he accurately explained to me that I didn't know anything about the economics of sports broadcast. <laughs> so uh, he asked me to write him a memo telling him what it would cost, and so I spent a week and made an estimate and uh, sent David a memo. And then not 10 minutes later, Rupert Murdoch called up and said, I understand you could track and highlight a hockey puck in two years for $2 million. And I said, yeah. And he said, do it. <laughs> so that's where this started. So it was introduced. We started in 94. 
It actually started very near here. There's a, an SGI building a couple buildings down, and we kicked off a meeting with a couple of people that are here today, um, Alan Trimble and Tim Heidman, who were key um, team members. And um, we started in 94, and I was introduced in the All-Star Game in 96. And David Hill accurately predicted that um, the diehard hockey fans would hate it, but heck, they're diehard fans, they're gonna watch anyway. Right. <laughs> and uh, they did hate it. But it did result in the best rating hockey had ever had at that point. So it was successful in that respect. Is this the, is this the kind of, yeah, please, go ahead. That's, uh, <laughs> is this the kind of thing only a non-hockey fan would ask somebody to do? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I think there was only one play that the hockey fans appreciated, which was a goal was scored by a shot ricocheting off the back of another hockey player. And the fans had to admit that they never would have known that's how the puck got into the goal had it not been oh, for the track system. But other than that, they were uniformly opposed to it. <laughs> so let's go to the next innovation, which is one we can all appreciate. This is the yellow line showing you where the first down is on the football field. <laughs> So talk a little bit about this one. Yeah, this one was far more popular. <laughs> um, and it was, it was um, more challenging in a couple of interesting ways. The, the puck, the trail of the puck, we just keyed it on top of everything. The challenge for this, and in fact, one of the guys here, Tim Heidman, thought it could never be done. But the challenge for this was to be able to compute where the yellow line should appear, but then look at the color of every pixel, decide which pixels corresponded to the mud or the grass, and which pixels corresponded by virtue <coughs> of being a different color to Every the athletes. Pixel. And so then we would draw around the athletes. And so by holding that yellow line fixed relative to the view of the real world, and by drawing around the athletes, we would create the illusion that it was on the ground. And um, it worked very well and it was very successful. We introduced it with um, ESPN, in the fall of 98, and it very quickly rolled out to all televised um, football games. You told me that when you first started putting the yellow line on the football field, your team had to drive an 18-wheeler loaded with high-end workstations into the production area just to generate the yellow line. Is that what computing was like back in yeah, and those the, days? Yeah, the original hockey puck, the puck truck as we called it. The and puck then truck. The puck truck was also used for the first yellow line. It was a 50-foot production truck with SGI impacts, and it was a major drama at every game to reseat the boards and get those computers running again. <laughs> um, now let's look at the next one. Uh, this, so, this is this is the K, the famous K zone in baseball. It it's done in an even more amazing way today. But talk a little bit about this. Yeah, this was um, actually the idea for this came from Jed Drake from ESPN. And um, we never would have sold it, never would have taken on this project had it not been for Alan Trimble, who's here tonight, who um, Jed sent him to Sport Vision, which is the company that I spun out from News Corp to found, which is whose engineering offices are now next door, mm -hmm. as it turns out. Um, but uh, Jed Drake sent Alan Trimble to Sport Vision to visit. And Alan went back and told Jed, well, they're going to make it work. I'm not going to. Alan didn't explain to Jed how, but he did explain that we would eventually make it work. So the question was whether Jed got the Emmy or somebody else. So uh, Jed decided to take on the project. So it was the K-Zone. We tracked the baseball to within a centimeter for its, most of its flight from the uh, pitcher to the plate. We superimposed the strike zone you know, above the plate, show the crosshair where the ball either goes through the strike zone or misses. And this was introduced in, 19, in about 2000. And what did the umpires union think about this? <laughs> it was fascinating. The umpires at first were incredibly opposed to it and hated it. But within two weeks, the umpires became huge advocates and our biggest supporters mm -hmm. because the K-Zone showed something that surprised everybody. They showed everybody, that the umpires were doing a much better job than anybody could have imagined. Because <laughs> um, with the exception of a few ESPN broadcasts, the center field camera wasn't exactly in line. And so there was a, there was a distortion there. 
in perspective. And the umpires were, in fact, doing a much better job. And so very quickly after that, uh, Major League Baseball worked with Sport Vision to instrument all ballparks. And even on those games where a system like this isn't being used, the baseball was still tracked. And the umpires in Major League Baseball used that data to um, you know, help rate the performance of mm. the umpires. So let's, uh, let's look at the last one. Th this is very familiar uh, to us all because uh, it's the Olympic speed skating rink where you can clearly see who's skating for which nation. Yeah, this was actually the, the principal objective of the system we did for the Olympics were the ones that many of you have seen where you have a line and it moves at the world record pace or the pace of the fastest athlete in the previous heat. Kind of as an add-on, we were asked to identify the nationality of the athletes you know, by superimposing national flags. And this was a particularly um, funny circumstance because we were criticized for having tripped the Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, and there's uh, photographic evidence that you did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's, let's talk. Uh, so for those of you who didn't know Stan and the work that he's done, it's been epic. If you're a sports fan, it's completely changed the experience of watching sport on television. And if you're not, I think it probably draws you in in a way that uh, uh, unaided sports broadcasting might not. But now you're taking on one of the toughest assignments ever. And I'd like for you to just tell the story about how you got involved with trying to change the viewing experience of the America's Cup. Well, I guess it, you know, I've kind of had parallel careers. One as, you know, fairly conventional career in technology, working for SRI, founding the vehicle navigation company, ETAC, ending up as head of technology for News Corp, spinning off my group to uh, start Sport Vision, which is virtually next door. And then, but in parallel to that, I had another career that I mostly took on in, you know, bits of, and pieces of time, certainly all of my vacation, but also good chunks <laughs> of leave without pay. And that was a tech, that was a career as a professional navigator in sailing. And as a professional navigator in sailing, I navigated the round the world record and did, did navigated and won the um, Volvo ocean race. But I also had the opportunity to navigate um, yachts for a number of owners, such as Larry Ellison and Sayonara, Steve Fawcett, um, Roy Disney, Richard Branson. And in um, 95 through about 97, I was navigating Sayonara, and this was the same period where we were introducing the and working on the puck and the first downline. And during the time I was navigating Sayonara, I mentioned to Larry, because he's certainly a um, technologist and very, you know, very smart guy. And so he very quickly understood what we were doing in terms of what's now called augmented reality. And I mentioned that the sports that benefit from this, these systems where you can insert graphics into the real world are those sports where there's something important to the sport that's hard to see. The first down line's a great example. The, first down line is the objective of almost every play, and yet you can't see it when the camera zooms in and you can no longer see the chain gang. The strike zone is certainly important in baseball, you know, to every pitch. And in sailing, the, I observed to um, Larry that there's lots of things in sailing that are important to the sport and hard to see, you know, such as the, you know, who's ahead, the 100 meter lines, the lay lines, you know, where the marks are. And so I, uh, mentioned that you know, to Larry, and that was in, again, uh, probably 96. And then to my astonishment, when I was navigating the round the world record for the French in 2010, um, there was an interview with Larry in um, Fortune magazine, and Larry mentioned that uh, when asked what is he gonna do with TV for the America's Cup, having won the America's Cup, um, he mentioned he was going to look up an old sailing colleague of his, you know, Stan Honey, and this is what we were going to do. <laughs> and uh, I was in the Southern Ocean at the time, so it was, it was quite something to read that, because you never know what you're going to do next in life, but in this sure. case, I did. Yeah. <laughs> and with Rupert Murdoch and Larry Ellison, you've worked for a couple of guys who can make it happen once they set their minds to it. That's very interesting. 
And so when I finally got in from that trip, on my uh, message machine was the message from Fresh. <laughs> yeah. Saying, let's talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, did you, Fresh, did you have an idea at that point what the vision was for changing the, the experience of sailing as a viewer? We certainly knew what was needed, if you know what I mean. It's um, quite often expert sailors, whilst watching sailing races, don't really know who's winning, believe it or not. You know, from just seeing the two boats sailing together, it's quite hard. And um, it's well known what was needed, but there's only really one person uh, in the world that we know of capable of providing what Stan's done, the Stan. It takes an incredible blend of technology from um, the capture of visual uh, images and the technology of positioning and, and many other things to integrate that all together. And um, Stan had done it before, but uh, sailing presented some unique challenges that the uh, other uh, things that you've seen him do didn't present, one of which is the fact that the whole frame, everything is moving. There's nothing anchored to the ground at all in those pictures, the uh, marks, the boats, the helicopter taking the pictures, everything's moving. So we do have about 45 seconds of a, a very long segment of video that begins to illustrate what you have done. Let's just look at that and maybe you can talk us through exactly how it works. So this is the match racing start. You need to see where the entry lines are, the port and starboard, and then of course the primary entry line, and then you see the start line up near the center top. So it's, um, imagine looking at that frame without the graphics, it'd be very difficult to interpret. There's the starting line. The starting line changes color at the instant of the start. So that line will change from red to white at the instant of the start. You can see the boats identified with the uh, labels off the tops of their masts. The, the yellow line is the lay line. That's the point at which a boat can reach the next mark without having to tack or jibe. And then you may have seen those white lines that are parallel. Those are the 100 meter lines. But the interesting thing about those 100 meter lines is that the combination of those lines in conjunction with the boundaries around the course allow almost any sports fan who's seen American football to very quickly interpret who's ahead. They, and the funny thing happens, which is normally in sailing, it's difficult to explain to a non-sailor the fact that the boats you know, are sailing in different directions. So people will say, wait a minute, it's a race. Why are the boats all going different ways? <laughs> and, but if you show you know, where the mark is, and you show those 100 meter lines, and you show the boundaries, and people get it. They say, OK, that's a field of play. That's a pitch. They're trying to go that way. And then they very quickly learn from them for themselves that you can't go straight at it. You can go one way or the other and you tack and eventually you get to the mark and they very quickly sort of embrace the tactics of getting up the beat. The other interesting thing about those 100 meter lines is it's interesting to note that the distance between each of those lines is approximately a football field. So that's the <laughs> other difficulty of televising sailing, which is it's a very large field of play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Talk for a minute about the technology that you've had to invent in order to essentially create multiple football fields on San Francisco Bay? Well, first I'll comment that it takes a team. Sure. And one of the things I'm most proud of, you know, in my career, you know, starting at SRI is the fact that I've been able to work with fabulous folks and I've been able to con them into helping me with future projects. <laughs> and so I've had the wonderful experience of being able to work with many of the same people for the last 30 years. And um, I think that's the reason why you know, we as a group have managed to you know, do a number of these projects that haven't been done before, because we have the confidence you know, working with one another and the, um, you know, the breadth of skills. The thing about sailing that was so tricky is that all the other sports that we've talked about, whether it's football, baseball, you know, a system we did for NASCAR where we tracked you know, all the race cars, all of those systems have cameras that are mounted on tripods. So they can pan and tilt, but it's relatively easy to measure the angle of the camera with optical encoders relative to the tripod. And it's relatively easy to use the camera itself as a theodolite to measure its own position, you know, surveying itself in. The thing about 
sailing that's so difficult is the camera's in a helicopter. The helicopter's you know, weaving all around in the sky, and it's a long way away from the field of play. And so, and then everything else is moving. The marks are moving, the sailboats are moving. So it's really, you know, a measurement challenge. So we have to measure the location of each of the sailboats to within two centimeters and its orientation to a tenth of a degree. And then we have to measure the position of the helicopter to two centimeters and its orientation to a hundredth of a degree. And the reason we need the helicopter angle so accurately is that it's you know, a thousand feet away from the field of play, and if we have its angle wrong, the graphics will swim around in the video of the real world. And then we need to measure the camera on the helicopter and its angle relative to the helicopter to a hundredth of a degree. Then we compute the point of view of the camera and the field of the view of the camera, compute the correspondence between every pixel and the appropriate place in the real world. Then, um, Alan Trimble, <laughs> who's here today, figures out what's important to the story. Yeah. So what graphics do we need to show? And then he presses the appropriate buttons, and then those graphics are displayed, superimposed in that helicopter video, just at the time the commentator is saying, let's go back and look at the Italian That's boat. amazing. <laughs> now, we, we talked a minute, I mean, that's phenomenal. We talked a minute ago about the puck truck and what it took 20 years ago to put the yellow line on the football field. What kind of technology are you using today to do all that? Well, we're using you know, high-powered sort of quad-core PCs. Um, and we tend to use the most powerful um, you know, PCs we can, can conveniently buy. And we tend to run them just up at their capability. And if we get too aggressive about the graphics, um, we have a problem and we have to back off a little bit, but we're basically running at the top edge of the most you know, powerful, reasonably available PCs. So anything we could go out and buy today at Best Buy or uh, not um, exactly, not far from it? Not far from it, but yeah. basically these are you know, purpose-built, rack-mounted, yeah. you know, powerful yeah. computers. Still, it's not a within, truck. Yeah, with NVIDIA cards, but it's not a truck. Right. So, Ian, the, the kind of technology that Stan is talking about that makes these amazing pictures possible uh, is, is also producing data for you guys. I mean, it's not, I'm not talking about the same platform. I'm talking about what you're relying on to improve the performance of the boat, to measure the performance and evaluate it. Can you talk a little bit about this, this sea of data that you guys are collecting on every boat and what you're trying to extract from that? Yeah, I mean, the, the boats are, are pretty technical. On my first America's Cup in 1984 and 85, we were sort of the first boat to have a computer on board, and it was a big deal. It was sort of an old uh, Microvax, I think it was, and it was about this big, and it had a huge bank of batteries to run it. And, and now we have, um, if you count the uh, tablets that we display all the data on for the crew, we probably have about 50 computers on the boat, little uh, computers, larger computers, but the technology of data collection is pretty much the same. What's changed dramatically over the period of time is the wealth of data uh, collect collection methods around. The actual sensors are relatively cheap and highly accurate. Um, these things have, have sort of blossomed out. So um, we, we get sort of like a doubling or a quadrupling of the number of sensors every America's Cup. Last Cup we had about 100. This Cup we have about 400 sensors on the boat. And, and they range from... Um, say a fiber optic uh, gyro inertial uh, motion system, which will tell you your accuracy. Stan uses a very similar thing in the helicopter. We have two of those, one on the boat and one on the wing to actually tell which way everything's oriented uh, relative to the world. And uh, these things generate a huge amount of accurate data, but that's just one of many sensors. We have fiber optic strain gauges. We have pressure sensors in the hydraulics. We have pressure sensors that measure the pressure of the wind on the wing. We have um, all sorts of instrumentation that just spews data to us at a, a relatively slow rate of 10 hertz for data collection. But on a big sailing boat, that's actually just about fast enough. And um, you're also measuring the physiology of the sailors themselves, right? With we have uh, heart rate monitors and uh, also power measurements of what the guys output so we can check in on the sailor. One of the rarest commodities on the boat is enough horsepower to actually do anything on the boat. So as the guys are working and getting tired, you can see the performance of the boat decrease in the manoeuvres as the guys get more and more tired. And usually the, the best jive of the day is the first one and the worst one 
is the last jive as the guys get tired. We monitor all of that, look at the performance of the guys across the actual race course from the start of the race to the finish. And um, it's really interesting to see the different physiological types of grinders and how each one performs at the start and end of the races. How do you feel about that, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> Tired. As I'm, as I'm nodding off. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, as Fresh says, the boats are um, incredibly demanding. One of the things we've learned is on a, on a, you know, the races are only 30 minutes, but on any one day that we're out testing, we can spend four or five hours out there. And on a big day when it's sort of tw around 20 knot day, the, you know, we're burning between five and 6,000 calories, you know, which is pretty... On a training day? Yeah. 6,000 calories yeah. a day. Very, very physical. That's amazing. Now, yeah. um, how, how is your, your strategy and the strategy of everybody that you work with on the team affected by the things that you're learning? And, and the perf how, what changes in your performance are you trying to achieve according to all of this information that you're getting and the debriefing you're doing with the team? To give you an idea, I mean, we, we've identified in a jibe about 12 actions that have a significant impact on how good a jibe is. A jibe is a maneuver we do where we change from one tack to the other, passing away from the wind, and it's what the boats do when they're flying at high speed. Um, there's about 12 things that need to be done well or perfectly to get a perfect jibe. Some of them um, require the actions of the guys controlling the hydro, the hydro surfaces that actually can control the orientation of the boat. The average human response time is about 50 milliseconds, and there's a window of about 70 to 80 that these things have to be done in to get a perfect response to the boat. And our, our coaches are on the boats watching this on the Perform on the chase boats following the yachts, they're watching how the guys are doing, what angle these, these uh, surfaces are at and how they're being pressed at the right time. And that's the sort of you know, level of technology where we're collecting the data, looking at the data and then feeding it back to the sailors as either on the water or off the water. And are you day. looking at this in real time? Can you see all of this happening as it happens? Yeah, we, we do. We have a performance boat which has got usually uh, three, four or five uh, technicians, you know, myself, um, a number of guys who run the system's instrumentation and also guys who analyse sails and crew performance. They're all on this boat together and we're uh, watching the boat real time. The structures guys will be watching the strain on the dagger boards or the strain in the wing. The uh, trainers will be watching the heart rates of the guys. All these different areas are being studied real time plus we beam the data back to shore and so that guys on shore in the design office, for example, can see what the boat's doing and um, take note of the performance of the boat and see how it's going. Has there ever been a sport, or in this case, just the America's Cup of Racing, where the data that was driving the boat was so closely integrated with the data you're getting and doing the coverage that it all seems to be moving kind of seamlessly together? <laughs> it's interesting, you know, F1 makes you know, ex extensive use of data off of the cars, but it's not nearly as closely integrated with the broadcast as I think we do in sailing. Mm -hmm. The other thing we do in sailing, which is, I think, remarkable for a sport, is the extent to which the data is used for the officiating and the management of the event itself. Now talk about that, because this, this time, the, the claim of a foul, the evaluation by the officials, and the ruling is occurring in real time at an unbelievably real speed. Can you talk about how, why that's happening now? Well, first, it's, it's extraordinary that it is happening, and it's especially extraordinary that it's happening with the America's Cup, because the America's Cup, in, in many ways, is the you know, oldest continuously competed for a trophy in all of sport, and so you'd expect it to be um, kind of behind the time somehow, but yet the America's Cup is more aggressive in its use of technology in the management of the event and the officiating of the event than any other sport. Mm -hmm. So for example, in you know, baseball and football, there's a lot of data. Um, but yet in baseball, because of the long tradition of baseball and the importance of that tradition, the, the strikes and balls are still called by the officials, even though you know, there exists very good data about the location of the ball. And of course, the tradition is the batter's playing both against the pitcher and the official. <laughs> but in sailing, the interesting thing about it is that the America's Cup has chosen to use this data in real time for the initial call. So that the umpiring of the America's Cup takes place in part on the water, but also it takes part in part on the booth. 
And the way the professional umpires have split it up is very sensible. All of the umpire calls that are based on measurements and fact alone are made in the booth based on these measurements. So if the call has to do with a boundary violation or was there an overlap between two boats at the instant of zone entry or was a boat OCS or which means on the course side of the starting line at the time the clock got to zero, those calls are all made in the booth based on measurements. Whereas there's other subjective calls that are made on the water, such as did a boat have an opportunity to keep clear? Could that boat have avoided that you know, collision? Those calls have to be made by sailors on the water who are umpires and who are you know, seeing what's actually mm. going on and can see the entire environment. Mm. But it is, a, it is remarkable to me how aggressive the America's Cup has been in using this data. I want to get back to the way these boats sail and this popping up out of the water and sailing on foils. Was this, was this a discovery? Did a boat suddenly pop out of the water one day and everybody was thinking, <laughs> holy cow, we can fly? Or, or was it part of the design ethic from the beginning? It's a good question. The original class rule, which uh, I was involved in, in uh, drafting, never envisaged the boats flying like they do. And it's so uh, at the first uh, start of this class of boats, which was back in uh, 2010, I think, um, there was uh, no idea of the boats flying. Um, very quickly, the, the Kiwi team um, came to the conclusion that it would be possible to fly the boat at some stage. They, they were mainly imagining going around the top mark. And um, this is where you're in a lot of danger of nose diving. And their belief was if you came around it in the water that you probably would nose dive, and by having foils and controlling the boat, you'd be able to fly. Um, they were right, and they spent a fair bit of time developing it. And the other teams that were aware of this, um, thinking about it, planning it, but saw the Kiwis doing it and, and got right on board with it and um, headed down that path. And you know, the difference is something in the order of 10 or 15% of the drag of the boat, and the speeds are about that different too. So if you're not flying, it's about 10 or 15% slower, which is dramatic on the water. Um, some of the challenges of, of this are, are interesting because sailing prior had generally been confined to being on the surface of the water, which made it a two-dimensional problem, which um, yacht designers and yachting technologists had got a good handle on. They understood all the forces and the boat getting forces sideways and fore and aft and the drag and the thrust. But um, the moment you put the third dimension, the Z dimension, suddenly started to play. A lot of the guys that were well-known and established yacht designers were struggling with what was going to make these boats fly and fly uh, safely and stably. And one of the great challenges of the boats is the stability of flight. And you'll see sometimes um, all of the boats, while they're flying fast, will get some sort of hobby horsing, we call it, where they'll go up and down. And it's where they're on the verge of stability. And they, if you look in aerodynamic terms, the boats are unstable. but um, there's sort of a three areas of stability in aircraft, which is unstable and unflyable, and then there's um, partially stable where input control can actually keep the plane straight. But if you let go of the stick, the plane will become unstable, and this is the area that the America's Cup boats dwell, and um, they range in stability, and the stability makes it easy to do manoeuvres and easy to sail, but in general, it also makes the boat slower. And so uh, there's a fair bit of energy that gets uh, used up in keeping the boat stable automatically in that case. And um, so the sailors are always pushing for a, uh, a less stable boat, which is faster. But on the other hand, the manoeuvres become slower. And also, there's an element of danger of capsizing or an accident. So this is a problem that's new to sailing and new to us as sailors and designers. And um, it's proved challenging to everybody. But it's a great new problem. It's a great thing to be involved in. What's the top speed you've seen your boat achieve? Um, we've, we've had some 45s and, uh, and or so, and I think... Um, 45 knots. 45 knots. That's and that in miles per hour that's is... That's 50, 50 or nearly 50 miles per hour. Yeah. And I think maybe the Kiwis have even gone faster. I think they've been uh, boasting about some 47s and 46 knots. And Matt, when you, you know, compared to... When you've been sailing at this level for over 25 years, or almost 25, what's it like to go that fast compared to the experience a normal sailor would have? Yeah, well now we sort of we sort of you know the 30, 35s you sort of take for granted, but when the boat gets up to 40, um, you're starting to know that it's 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 hauling, and you know you get a bit of cavitation. Or the rudders, the rudders on the rudders on the back have wings as well, which help stabilise the stern of the boat, and the windward one, the weather one, 
is um, normally just sitting on the surface mm. and that starts bouncing away. And when you get it doing 45, you, we actually, um, in our safety gear now, we have oxygen and we have um, harnesses. So when you get up over 40, 42 knots, most of the guys are normally clipping on and, and you know you're doing it. But mm. for 35 knots, that's all day long now. Wow. 35. <laughs> it's one, a ride, one it's a ride the, in the park. <laughs> one, one of the cavitation things that's quite interesting is that the boat in that instability starts going up and down and the, uh, the vertical forces on the foils change and the thing will cavitate and, and uh, then reattach as it does this and that'll actually exacerbate the, uh, the problem and it starts getting into a rhythm and uh, starts porpoising and that's when you see some of the teams have uh, big problems. Um, and assess for the moment... Uh, the, the Kiwis. Can you just give me your views? <laughs> they, they, yeah, they, they look good. We've been really impressed. They're sailing the boats. Uh, you know, they came out of the blocks earlier than us in the build program. They, des they decided to um, um, design and build very quickly. We put uh, three months more time into our design. Um, so we were a little bit behind them. Um, and yeah, we've been watching them really closely. They, we, we're going to have a great match against them. They, they're going to be good. And you're still, is the format still going to be to try to run two races a day, if you can? Yeah, in the America's Cup, the actual wind limits are a little bit higher. In the Louis Vuitton, they had lower wind speeds to uh, limit the racing and make it a little bit safer. Also, it was in the windiest part of the year, so the, the element of danger was quite high. Um, now we're in later in the year, the winds are a little bit more benign and the wind limits are three knots higher, or two and a half knots higher than the uh, Louis Vuitton. So it's likely we'll be able to get two races a day in, and that's our plan, starting on the 7th, and then the, we race on the weekends, and then on the Tuesday and Thursday, I believe, and then the weekend. It's the first team to get nine wins, and so um, it'll go for at least a week, and maybe even two weeks if it goes right to the wire. The, the, someone has seen your coverage and, and has asked about um, the way that you show the wind angle on TV, and that reminded me, uh, there's a phrase that viewers often hear called dirty air, that the, the trailing boat obviously has to be aware of that. Can you talk a little bit about how that's working in the coverage and how you're trying to illustrate that for those of us who are just novices? Yeah, it's, an, a, it's a good example of one of the principal objectives of you know, this inserted graphic system, which is to take things that are hard to see and important to the sport and make them easy to see. And one of the things in sailing that we use as competitors is if you're ahead, you try to put the boat behind in what you call your dirty air. And if you're behind, you try to stay out of it. Or in conventional slower boats, if you're behind on the run, you try to arrange for your bad air to fall on the competitor that's ahead. And so sailors become very good at judging and learning, you know, where the bad air is. Um, and that air isn't bad, but it's, it's slowed and it's turbulent by virtue of having gone over the sails and having some of the energy drawn out of it by the boat. The, um, and so what we've done, and in fact, um, Tim Heidman, who's here tonight, was the principal architect of it, using um, CFD data that came from Oracle Racing, from uh, Joseph Ozan. But what we did is we um, rendered it so that you can see the bad air in the live line view. And the thing that's particularly interesting about these boats is that they go downwind much faster than the wind. And so when they're going downwind, as Fresh mentioned, the bad air is still behind them. In fact, it's you know, only about 30 degrees off their transom when they're going downwind. So the boat behind on a run can never, ever provide bad air to the boat ahead. So it makes it that much difficult for the boat behind to catch up. But it's a very difficult story to tell. And so mm -hmm. it's very helpful for the commentators to have us be able to render that bad air. And there have been a couple of dramatic instances where the Kiwis went over um, the Italians. And just as the bad air, as rendered on the TV, crosses the sails of the Italians, the Italians' weather hull flops into the water. And so it was a very graphic mm. illustration that the, the simulations are, in fact, correct. So you could literally see that happening, right. that bad, bad air strategy. Let me wrap this up with two final questions. That's, we had some excellent questions from the audience, and thank you very much for that. One is, uh, have we gotten to a point in sailing, like in 
other areas of life where the technology has been pushed to the maximum limit of the human ability to to sail these boats and and really master it and uh, or do you would you predict that we're going to continue to try to go even further in the future I'd have to say on, on this is really the opening of the door of this type of sailing and um, there's been big multi holes around uh, in sailing for some time but never has there been this much technology and this much uh, money and effort placed on these big fast boats and we are really just starting in this area and um, if we had another year I think the boats would probably be 10% faster, maybe 15% faster. Your question about how does a human fit in, into that, um, we could if we were allowed to by the rules computerise some of the parts of the boat but if you look at the complexity of all of the manoeuvres and all of the sailing of these boats there's no way that you can integrate enough input and enough brains and logic and enough output to actually do anywhere near as good a job as the guys do as uh, after their training and practices, you know, made them pretty much the, the perfect machine for the job. There's a lot of input that we give them instrumentationally and also in coaching. But at the end of the day, there's, um, the human being still a very, very efficient and uh, smart computer. Any other thoughts on that, that question, Matt? Yeah, Stan? I think, you know, the, the whole wing foiling thing is, you know, it's obviously a new era, but it's out there now. There's um, the little uh, international moths that are flying around. They're, they're those little, they're 12 foot thingies that are foiling doing 30 knots, you know. And there's a, that, that's, the, that's where it's heading, you know. The, the kite boards are now starting to foil. I think it's just going to, you know, carry on. I think, you know, you look down the line, it might be five or ten years, I'm not sure, but I would imagine, you know, why wouldn't your little power boat have foils on it, you know? <laughs> It's yeah. way more efficient, you know, right. you're not dragging the hull around in the water and you're not going to slam all, all the way home. It's, I think it's, it's, it'll happen. That's amazing. It's interesting that a lot of innovation has come out of the America's Cup and it's often been in areas that were unintended. <laughs> you know, like the wing keel or, you know, various rigging innovations. Mm. It wasn't, those innovations weren't intended by the rule. And as Fresh mentioned, this one wasn't either that, you know, foiling, you know, was, I think, originally intended to be precluded by the rule, but nevertheless, <laughs> it happened. And yet, at the end of the day, I think it'll be the biggest contribution that this America's Cup mm. makes to sailing. And I think, I doubt you'll ever see a high-performance multi-hull again that isn't capable of foiling. So, and then I think with respect to the, the sail handling, I think that's part of the challenge of the technology, is to make boats faster and but still handleable by humans and you know I've done a couple of attempts to set the round the world record and that's always the challenge there's no limit to the size of boat for those records what the only limit is it has to be sailed by humans so then what people try to do with the technology is come up with sail handling techniques that mm -hmm. can allow ever faster boats still within the limitation of a human crew to handle it and so the last question now that we're all totally educated on the, the coverage, the technology, the boats, the crews. What should we all be watching for when the racing starts next weekend? Stan, you want to start? We'll go Stan, Matt, and Ian. I think what you want to do is to try to characterize the strengths of the different teams. So, you know, the Kiwis, they're very smooth in their maneuvers. They've been doing an extraordinary job um, in you know, using the current to their advantage, particularly for a, a team from overseas. They've gotten a lot of local expertise and they're doing a very nice job of that. Um, and I think I wouldn't be surprised if the, uh, the strength of the uh, Oracle team is their speed. And so I think one way to, to look at the races is to, you know, figure out what the strengths of the different teams are and then see how those trade off and and who's going to take advantage of those strengths and which strengths will be dominant enough mm. to win. Matt, how about you? Yeah, I just, um, you know, we, we're obviously not underestimating the New Zealand team, but, um, you know, I, I also feel that they haven't been under any pressure yet. So um, <laughs> we're, we're going to, uh, we're, we're certainly going to apply some pressure to them and, uh, See, see how they handle it, and um, you know it's 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 going to be exciting. 
new class, you know, the first pre-start, getting off, you know, the, the start's the key, the first reach is the key, and um, deciding when to bail out on that first jibe, it seems to be, uh, you know, we've done some in-house racing where the difference between getting that first jibe right it can be up to a couple of hundred metres. It's, uh, it's significant. Wow. So that's, that, that's probably 40, 50% of the race, the first couple of minutes. So the first couple of minutes of the race, we'll, we'll see how it's shaping up every It'll, day. You'll have a, yeah, you'll every have a fair idea. Yeah. But, you know, like we're, uh, we're lucky with our boats. They're very close in speed. So, um, you know, we've, we've had races where we've had four or five lead changes throughout a race. So... You know, hopefully that's going to be a great match and, you know, it'll obviously go our way. But, it, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the event deserves now to see a good, good battle. Yeah. That's what we want to see. Fresh, you get the last word. <laughs> I hope I'm worthy. But um, one, one thing that will be, uh, I think, really interesting is that the um, September is an interesting meteorological month for, for San Francisco. It's in the transition from the summer pattern into winter and um, you can really get anything. You can get light, hot, sunny days, or you can get fog, you can get really strong winds, you can get everything. And um, the Kiwis have come through a quite a, a windy session. They've had races cancelled because it's too windy. They've done a lot of sailing in strong winds, but September's a different month. And um, I think it'll be really interesting to keep an eye on what the wind's going to do that day and see which boat does better in the light wind, strong wind. And sort of, it'll give you a good estimate of um, what's going to happen down the track as the weather sort of unfolds and the patterns become uh, apparent. But it's going to be a very interesting uh, part of the regatta. Mm. And it, like, as Mandy said, though, the first reach and the first jibe is a really uh, the most critical part of the race. And uh, the guys who do a good job there will be uh, in pretty good shape. So there's a rhetorical question I didn't get to, and we'll just leave it open, which was after uh, Oracle Team USA wins again, when will the next America's Cup race be back in San Francisco? So we'll just leave that one open for now. <laughs> and like with, our, with our thanks, Stan, Matt, Ian, thanks so much for being here tonight. Thank you. The America's Cup victory by Oracle Team USA was one of the greatest technology-fueled stories in sporting history. There are hundreds of stories like this at the Computer History Museum. Join us next time for the Computer History Museum presents Revolutionaries.